monotonous sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground, with walls and towers were girdled round, and there were gardens bright with sinuous rills, where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree. And here were forests, ancient as the hills, enfolding sunny spots of greenery. But oh, that deep romantic chasm, which slanted down the green hill athwart a cedarn cover, a savage place, as holy and enchanted as e'er beneath a waning moon was haunted by woman wailing for her demon lover. And from this chasm, with ceaseless turmoil seething, as if this earth in thick, fast, thick, fa thick, fast, thick pants were breathing, a mighty fountain momently was forced amid those swift, half intermitted burst, huge fragments vaulted like rebounding hail or chaffy grain beneath the thresher's flail. And mid these dancing rocks at once and ever, it flung up momently the sacred river. Five miles meandering with a mazy motion, through wood and dale the sacred river ran, then reached the caverns measureless to man and sank in tumult to a lifeless ocean. And mid this tumult, Kubla heard, Kubla heard from far ancestral voices prophesying war. The shadows of the dome of pleasure floated midway on the waves, where was heard the mingled measure from the fountain and the caves. It was a miracle of rare device, a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice. A damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw. It was an abyssian maid, and on her dulcimer she played, singing of Mount Abora. Could I revive within me her symphony and song? To such a deep delight would win me, that with music loud and long, I would build that dome in air, that sunny dome, those caves of ice, and all who heard should see them there, and all should cry, beware, beware. His flashing eyes, his floating hair, weave a circle round him thrice, and close your eyes with holy dread, for he on honeydew had fed and drunk the milk of paradise. Pretty phenomenal stuff. Perhaps the person from Portlock interrupted Sam before he got to the pent ponds of lemon pie. I have a sip of my drink. Another dreamed masterpiece later. But for now, let's go back to the beginning. The very first dreams in literature make it clear what the ancients thought of dreams. There were messages from other worlds. Here's a very famous one. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Heron. He came to the place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down at that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above, stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your descendants. And your descendants shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. <coughs> and Jacob was afraid and said, This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. A thousand, or years, a thousand or more years later, across Italy, Virgil had the same idea of dreams. In the Aeneid, the greatest work of Roman literature, the Trojan Aeneas, our hero and the founder of Rome, is warned of Troy's destruction by his dead brother Hector. It was the hour when first sleep begins for weary mortals. It steals over them as the sweetest gift of the gods. See, in dreams, before my eyes, Hector seemed to stand there, saddest of all, and pouring out great tears, torn by the chariot, as once he was, black with bloody dust, and his swollen feet pierced by the thongs. Oh, how he looked, how changed he was from that Hector who returned wearing Achilles' armor, or who set the Trojan flames to the Greek ships. His beard was ragged 
his hair matted with blood, bearing those many wounds he received, dragged round the walls of his city. And I seemed to weep myself, calling out to him and speaking to him in words of sorrow. O oh, light of the Troad, surest hope of the Trojans, what has delayed you so? What shore do you come from, Hector the long-awaited? Weary from the many troubles of our people and our city, I see you. Oh, after the death of so many of your kin, what shameful events have marred that clear face? And why do I see these wounds? He does not reply, 